Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for joining today's webcast, Universal Nasal Decolonization, an Unexpected Solution to Hospital Staffing and Financial Concerns. My name is Kevin Watson, Senior Director of Marketing at Nozen, and I'm moderating today's event. We're thrilled to have two experts in the field of infection prevention. Let me just touch on a couple of housekeeping items first. Um, the presentation is structured to provide ample time for Q&A, so feel free to enter your questions in the chat box at any time. If you need assistance during the webinar, please don't hesitate to send me a message or use the same chat box in the attendee panel. A copy of today's presentation and clinical studies are available in the handouts pane. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished presenters, starting with Karen. Karen Hoffman has specialized in infection prevention and control for four decades, including serving for 24 years as the Associate Director of North Carolina Statewide Program for Infection Control and Epidemiology, SPICE. She is a clinical instructor at University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Karen also served as the Infection Prevention Consultant for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, from 2011 to 2020. She's a fellow in both the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology of America, SHEA, and Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, AKA APIC. Karen was the APIC president in 2019. She received many awards for her service and contributions to the field of infection prevention, including the 2023 APIC Carol B. DeMille Lifetime Achievement Award. She is a frequent speaker at regional, national, and international conferences. Karen earned her BS in nursing from Indiana University and her master's in healthcare epidemiology from the University of Virginia. Karen, thank you for being here and we're honored to have you. We're also honored to have uh, Connie Steed here with us today. Hi, Connie. Connie has worked in the field of infection prevention and control for 40 years. Connie's experience spans the continuum of care, including academic and community acute care hospitals, long-term care and ambulatory care. She most recently served as the Corporate Director of Infection Prevention at Prisma Health in South Carolina, from which she retired. Connie is currently a consultant specializing in infection prevention and control. Connie is a fellow at APIC, and she also served in multiple capacities, including 2020 APIC president, and she was a recipient of the 2018 APIC President's Distinguished Service Award in honor of Patricia Lynch. Connie is currently serving on the CDC Personnel Health and Isolation Precautions Workgroup. She has published in the field and has spent uh, presented nationally and internationally. She is board certified in infection prevention and control since 1985. And Connie is also a certified change agent. She received her bachelor's and master's in nursing from Clemson University. Thank you both for being here today. If we could cover the uh, learning objectives. Uh, the three learning objectives identify a strategy your hospital can use to improve operational and financial performance through better innovative patient care. Secondly, demonstrate how a well-designed high impact infection prevention program can help address problems senior leadership are most concerned about. And third, explain how to translate clinical success into performance metrics that match organizational goals. So with that, Connie, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. Karen and I are very happy to be here with you today to talk about a subject that we are both passionate about. I'd like to begin first, however, by starting with a short story as told through the eyes of a senior leadership executive named Angela. And you see Angela here on the slide. I will be her in first person. So with that, hi, my name is Angela. Like all senior healthcare executives today, our leadership team is struggling to ensure the kind of patient care that we all want to provide. More and more, it seems that we have very little time to spend on developing new strategies that intend to innovate efficient patient quality and care. This is really the very reason we chose healthcare. We wanted to make our world a safer place, many of us. Next slide. Every day, 
we are inundated with opportunities and chaos related to what's going on, staffing needs, reimbursement problems, cash flow issues, patient throughput opportunities, penalties, and consumer quality scores. The challenges are endless, and many times I get frustrated and, quite honestly, overwhelmed. I suspect you might also feel sometimes the same way. Running and leading hospitals is challenging, and it's only getting much more concerningly that way. Sometimes I feel like we are getting farther and farther away from what we are here to do, and that's to ensure the best care for our patients and our communities. Next slide. We are also bombarded many times with exciting solutions, maybe, things that we would be doing to facilitate efficiency and quality. So much of what we're calling innovations feels foreign to us. New software to make every aspect of the business run better. Databases, artificial intelligence. Would artificial intelligence help patients and save money? We are working to integrate under pressure to expand our service lines and our organization by merge, and partner with others. Everything is chaotic, complicated, and time-consuming, much more. And it's costly. And what's concerning to me, I'm worried that none of these solutions will actually help us take better care of our patients. There really has to be a better way, I think. But wait, you know, I think there is a better way. And maybe just taking better care of our patients is the answer. Could it really be that simple? It's chaos uh, going on all around us, but when things seem overwhelming, it's often best to go back to the basics. After all, we're in this business to make sick patients well again, and everything starts and ends with patient safety. It's true from a clinical point of view. It's also true from a management point of view. And if we take safer, better care of our patients, it's actually good for business. We sometimes lose track of that in today's complicated and frustrating world. And in the next hour, we're going to talk about a simple, unexpected way that we can offer better care to our patients. We're also going to explore how taking better care of our patients can help solve many of the issues we're concerned about today, such as better hospital efficiency, throughput, and financial performance. Could it be that a simple solution has been right under our noses the entire time? So each year, HAI costs in the U.S. around 35 to $45 billion. And so while healthcare facilities are challenged with many MDROs, Staff Aureus, in fact, remains the number one cause of the reportable and most expensive to treat device and procedure-related HAIs, including the number one causes of CLAPSI, PVAP, and SSIs. So today, we're going to discuss one example of an emerging standard of care. It's a simple act that any healthcare worker can do in about a minute, and that could avoid almost 200,000 infections while saving up to 30 million healthcare worker hours and over 6 billion in treatment costs if this was implemented across all U.S. hospitals. So that's 30 million hours available to treat additional patients, not to mention the plethora of additional patient days that would become available. And that simple act is nasal decolonization. It may sound impossible, but let's take a look. So you might be saying, how can this be? Well, we, we've learned over the last few decades that the nose plays a very important role in infection. And that's because it's actually a reservoir in this case, primarily of Staph aureus, the major reservoir of all pathogens is the nose responsible for most HAIs. And when this reservoir is effectively substantially reduced, colonization pressure is also going to be reduced, not just on the nose, but throughout the facility. And when that colonization pressure is reduced, so is the risk of infection. So this seems very simple. Why are we not decolonizing all patients now? Well, there's two reasons. First, it took decades to fully realize the power of universal nasal decolonization. It really wasn't until 2013 
that we started to see that universal decolonization reduced infection risk much better than actually using targeted strategies. So some brave IPs seeing the potential try decolonizing every patient for their length of stay, and they found that infection and readmissions dropped dramatically. But these programs could only be executed with some new nasal decolonization technologies that were being developed to meet the need. So let's look at why universal nasal decolonization works so well clinically. First, targeting strategies cannot work for large groups. On any given day, 30% or more of your admits are going to be staph aureus colonized. But which ones are they? There's no way to know. Even if you tried to test every patient, which is operationally and financially impossible, you would not be able to tell because half of all colonized patients are transients, colonized today, but maybe not tomorrow. And that's just the way staph aureus colonization works. Most of the pathogens that cause HAIs are also found in the nose. So the reality is you cannot know who is colonized. So the answer is obvious, decolonize everyone. But is this really feasible and would it work? So let's think about that. So colonization actually causes two problems. It raises endogenous infection risk for the patient and it creates a transmission risk for every other patient. We know that a staph colonized patient contaminates their entire room in less than 24 hours. And we know that patients put in rooms where former patients were colonized are two times more likely to become infected. Many studies suggest that transmission is the major risk. In a very large VA study, transmission was found to be responsible for about 66% of hospital onset MRSA. And more surprisingly, 31% of community onset infections. So the targeting strategies cannot defend against this risk, but universal decolonization can and does. So when you think about it, it's clear why universal nasal decolonization works so well. Every other infection prevention intervention that you are employing, whether it be hand hygiene, environmental cleaning, the UV technologies or targeted bundles, they're simply gonna work better because the pathogen burden around that patient is gonna be much lower. And that is exactly what facilities using this strategy are reporting. Universal decolonization is the fourth pillar in infection prevention. Now, nasal decolonization is still an ongoing journey. So let's look at the evolution of its use. Because of ongoing staph outbreaks in the 80s, mupirocin was used as a targeted pre-op adjunct for ortho patients who had uh, screened MRSA positive. This strategy proved that targeted nasal decolonization reduced SSI infection risk. The failure rate in antibiotic stewardship issues were more than offset by the reduced SSI um, reductions. But when protocols expanded to include all ortho patients with no screening, plus many other procedure uh, related uh, high risk patients, antibiotic stewardship became problematic. And povidone iodine products emerged to kind of fill that pre op decolonization need. Then in 2013, a CDC Epi Center supported study proved that universal daily nasal decolonization of all ICU patients significantly reduced infections versus using the targeted approach to isolate or treat strategies that were formerly employed. And new guidelines do recommend to add nasal decolonization for all high risk patients in addition to all um, um, non-ICU and surgery patients. So it's really a simple concept and studies now support that all patients in the hospital benefit from a universal nasal decolonization program. It's gonna lower the colonization pressure, it's gonna protect all patients. Meanwhile, as the protocols are moving towards this universal decolonization, manufacturers are developing technologies to meet those changing demands. Mupirocin is certainly not ideal for widespread use. In povidone iodine, it was fine for one-time pre-op use, but it's too unpleasant and too expensive for daily universal use. Alcohol-based nasal decolonization products have emerged that are easy and fast to use. They're pleasant, they're well-tolerated, they provide broad spectrum, fast action, and surprisingly, they have a 12-hour persistence. So this has allowed innovative IPs to implement universal protocols to protect every patient 
using universal daily decolonization uh, of all patients. And they did this based on the knowledge that 60% of the avoidable infections happened outside the hospital, outside the ICU as well. So facilities adopted these, that have adopted these protocols, they began reporting exceptional results that we'll look at in just a minute. So uh, what we're talking about here is a deeper understanding of the role of the nose and the negative impact of the resulting colonization pressure and how that's led to expanded protocols supported by new and innovative products that are designed for economical daily use. And as we see, this strategy did have highly significant results. So here we have a real world example of a proof it works. This 365 bed community hospital with 39 adult ICU beds implemented the nasal decolonization strategies in their ICUs with their high risk um, patients with central lines and SSIs, including more than two thirds of all their patient population. Based on that success, they're now moving towards a universal decolonization program of all patients. So what this facility did, and with some help from their vendor, was to capture the true value of the nasal decolonization program and report it to senior leadership in terms consistent with their management targets. So these are actual numbers reported by the facility and it's very different from a controlled study. This facility simply followed the manufacturer's recommended recommendations and then measured the results. So in the year after the implementation of the program, this facility avoided 12 collapses, resulting in approximately 577,000 avoided treatment costs and eight VAPs that were avoided, saving an additional 377,000 in treatment costs. An additional 70 patients that would have been readmitted for hospital-associated MRSA infections were not readmitted, saving an additional $876,000. And all together, they avoided about 1.8 million in additional treatment costs. The majority of these costs would have been uncompensated. So this is a significant savings, even for a 365 bed facility. And these are hard savings. This is not an estimate of the effect. This is actually what happened in this facility. Now to fully capture the value of that program and translate that value into metrics, senior leadership is focused on uh, the, the number of excess patient days saved by avoiding infection treatment and readmissions. So this totaled to about 211 days. And based on their occupancy rate and average net revenue per patient, they estimated that they generated an additional $952,000 in revenue. And then they looked at the estimated number of healthcare worker total hours saved by avoiding infections and readmissions of around 2,400 hours. That's more than one full-time healthcare worker. The result was a full program value of, ne of nearly $2.8 million with a total product cost of about $367,000. This method helped IPs fully represent the impact of these programs and it allows senior leadership to better allocate their resources. And in this case, it's hard to find any investments that requires no capital investment, no additional manpower, that returns over seven times the investment, especially when the investment could be stopped at any time with no penalties if the program failed to meet expectations. So the second real world example is a 136 bed community hospital with 24 ICU beds that was still using screen and isolate for MRSA. So they implemented in all patients for their length of stay program and immediately saw the benefits. And so because this hospital is able to eliminate MRSA screening and isolating by decolonizing every patient, they realized almost 200,000 in direct costs. They avoided infections and readmission treatment costs about, of about $550,000. The estimated net revenue, patient revenue gain of $2.3 million was achieved by utilizing the bed days made available because of the reduced length of stay resulting from avoided infections, plus an estimated nearly 4,000 healthcare worker hours saved by not having to provide care for patients with extended stays. So this hospital um, savings is around $3 million 
They spent $130,000 for the nasal decolonization product and really showed the power of universal nasal decolonization. This is exactly why facilities are moving towards protecting all patients and while, why this is going to be the standard of care in just a few years. And as an aside note, notice how these IPs translated their infection and readmission um, uh, success into staffing and financial gains for their facility. They showed the full impact of their programs to senior leadership. It's a very powerful way to underscore the importance of infection prevention and of protecting all patients. <clears throat> so here we see nine of the 18 independent studies. These were not industry supported. The studies were published by hospitals that chose to use this expanded nasal decolonization program for all patients. These facilities used a novel alcohol-based nasal antiseptic for decolonization. And these studies were presented in either published peer-reviewed papers or at national meetings and by abstracts. And each study noted significant results in SSIs or CLAPSIs or MRSA bacteremia, depending on the study protocol that was being assessed. Now I'm aware that there are about 12 more studies in progress, and I'm also uh, about to complete a meta-analysis that has combined the nine published studies and abstracts on the impact of using the, the alcohol-based nasal antiseptic for preventing SSIs. And this has shown a highly statistically significant result in these crossover studies. So these real world studies are extremely valuable as they kind of offer the best we have in an unvarnished look at what really happens when these programs are implemented. Controlled studies are important, but when innovative ideas come along, it's often this, these gray data sources that provide the best and sometimes only source of outcome data. Patient safety should always be the foremost issue. And nasal decolonization products have been shown to be very safe over many years of use. And uh, the uh, guidelines, guidelines often lag behind these significant advances in adoption of new ideas. So IPs need to evaluate outcome data for themselves some, at times and make determinations, understanding that the guidelines may take years to catch up. And that is certainly the case here. But uh, as we've seen, AORN, for example, has actually recently updated 2021, their guidance to include these expanded protocols and recommended products that mirror the protocols employed in these outcome reports. So given the challenges that hospitals are facing, some vendors have really stepped up to provide more support and help to implement these programs in ways of analytical tools in the form of a customized risk profile and value proposition, expert help with clinical support, program design and getting internal buy-in, Implementation support by help with developing policies and procedures, consultation with IT and on-site team educators for staff training, and even post-implementation continued support after you go live with your follow-up um, quarterly audits. Uh, these industry partners do this every day and they get dramatic results in their HAI reductions. So if every hospital adopted this universal nasal decolonization paradigm shift, a strategy that's designed to protect every patient from the first hour of admission to the time of discharge by providing a safer environment, we could estimate that the U.S. hospitals could save $6.8 billion in preventable HAI treatment costs and a 30 million healthcare personnel hours saved. So while we know hospitals have fi serious financial issues, most importantly, as an infection preventionist, if every hospital adopted this strategy, an estimated 190,000 patients and their families would not suffer with a preventable serious infection. But also because it's been shown to be good for business and a good return on investment, nasal decolonization is the best way to have and prevent HAIs. So I'm going to pass the microphone back to my colleague, Connie Steve. Thank you, Karen, so much for a wonderful overview. The role of myself talking to you now is just to really give it a world, world perspective. I've been in the realities of frontline healthcare for over 40 years and have been in your position. And so what's going on today? As I've already shared by being Angela at the beginning of this presentation, 
it's challenging right now. We're having to learn how to get back to the basics. But what is expected of us? Number one, quality patient care. And we have to do that in a cost and process efficient manner because of the concern about finances. Where we continue to have a challenge is with sustainability. Healthcare organizations must learn how to sustain established standards of care and practice, which we're having tremendous challenges in doing. Next slide. As we have learned from this previous COVID pandemic that we're still not completely over. We all understand what happened to not only the United States, but the world. We went into chaos, supply chain issues, staffing issues. Many of our environments just were not adequately set up to take care of these patients. So we can all sense and feel it and understand it because we all lived it. What the CDC and other infectious disease experts did is look at our data. They looked at quarter three of 2019 pre-COVID pandemic and compared it to quarter three of 2021 towards the end of the pandemic. And what we saw was very concerning. We really just completely lost it on the standard of practice and quality. Our ventilator associated events went up by 60%. Catherine associated UTAs a little bit to almost 14%. Central line associated blood stream infections and MRSA bacteremias both went up tremendously as well. And so the message that was afforded us in this, I think, very important publication by Lassinger and Itchy is this. There is an urgent need for us to respond to these increases in healthcare associated infections. And healthcare providers and industry we've got to not only learn about what the best standard of practice is, we have got to learn how to sustain it over time. So even in the biggest disasters like COVID-19, our patients receive the best care. Next slide. So one of the things that Karen showed us were two of the stories about hospitals that had areas of opportunity related to HAIs. And I want to make it a little personal for you. In the first big hospital, it was Lou, the infection preventionist, and Ty, the director of infection prevention that led that effort with the assistance and teamwork of the quality leadership and frontline staff, nursing leadership, and everything else. It took a team. Then we have Scott, the infection preventionist in the smaller facility that did the same thing with the help of physician leaders and senior leadership to make it all the way through. It is extremely important for us IPs to make sure we show the complete value of effective infection prevention and control programs because they need these kinds of programs. We need these kinds of programs to improve uh, risk, to reduce risk and really work towards zero harm, zero infections. So we have to translate infection prevention impacts into key metrics that senior leadership thinks of and manages. And as Karen mentioned, with this particular process initiative, there is no capital investment. That's where the money is. No software to buy or implement. And then lastly, the biggest thing we spend money on, staff, this doesn't require any additional staffing. The thing that we can control is the process itself and the product. And we can modify the program based on performance at any time with no penalty. So really, in all honesty, the risk and the impact of this program is really up to the organization if they choose to implement it. Why is that? Because as the, we know the product works. It's all about the people side of change. Our staff held accountable is the implementation and supply available? And are we monitoring to ensure that sustainability is there? Next slide. So what is the return on investment for the organization? What am I getting? Well, number one is very clear, as Karen described, that specific to patient safety and quality, 
we see reduced infections and readmissions because a lot of these HAIs occur post-discharge and the severe ones like MRSA and Staph aureus infections many times are readmitted for care of those infections. We also reduce length of stay, which is a big deal, especially because it improves our throughput through the organization. How many of you had, like I had in our organizations and many of our facilities, we had this clogging of patients in the ED where they can't get out of the ED because the ICUs are full or the medical beds are full. And so they wait. And so care cannot be rendered to all patients in the best environment unless we can improve that throughput. And we can do that by reducing complications such as healthcare associated infections, which reduce patient length of stay. This also affords a little bit of profit and additional revenue potential for the organization. Lastly, if we do better at taking care of our patients, our outcomes will show that. When the data is reported, it will eventually improve reputation, uh, reputation and perception of the organization's quality of care. And then it can potentially reduce those financial penalties that result from hospital-associated infections such as value-based purchasing. Next slide. So what really is the risk if we do this? Is it a big deal? And the answer is no. The risk to the patient is minimal. This product and this protocol and process has been used by millions of patients safely and successfully over the last many years in over 1,100 hospitals. To the organization, the issue would be that the results of implementing the protocol do not meet expectations. I'm here to tell you, but because of people like Lou, Ty, Scott, other quality patient safety frontline staff made sure that people were held accountable, monitored, fed back opportunities to the frontline to ensure that the process that improves the outcome, universal nasal decolonization was sustained. And when that happens, the organization wins. So the organization can control that risk by holding people accountable to it. Next slide. So in summary, we need to ensure that we show our organizations the value of effective prevention and control programs. Not just, well, we'll reduce HAIs. Look at the robust value proposition that Karen shared with you of two healthcare organizations. I did that and used to do that when I worked in healthcare to help leadership understand the importance and value of effective infection prevention and control programs, which is the centerpiece of patient safety and quality care. So maybe the answer is right under your, our nose. Safe or better care is good for business. It doesn't have to be complex. It's as simple as going back to basics and impl implementing simple solutions such as universal nasal decolonization. Kevin? Thank you, Connie, appreciate that. Uh, well, this really takes us to the question and answer portion of the webinar. So as a reminder to the audience, you may submit questions by entering them in the chat box and I have received some uh, directly to me, so that works as well. If we do have any unanswered questions, Connie and Karen have offered to, to follow up with those via email afterward. So, so with that, uh, let me ask here the first question. So, and I'll, I'll share this one to you, Connie, but Karen, feel free to, uh, to add anything. How does nasal decolonization fit in with hand hygiene, cleaning, um, and other infection prevention protocols? So uh, what I would say is it's just another basic horizontal approach to preventing infection. Hand hygiene is horizontal. We practice it on everyone. We clean everybody's environment. And in this case, we add to that horizontal approach by protecting all patients, reducing that colonization pressure by decolonizing the nose. 
Many of us have bundles. We had bundles for CLABZ, PVAP, Howdy, everything. This could be part of the universal bundle that helps reduce all of these infections uh, by decolonization, nasal decolonization. It works. That's how it fits in. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, and I completely agree with what Connie said, but I'll just add that, you know, all the strategies that we use, no one strategy does everything. So hand hygiene rates of compliance uh, average around 50% with high rates in 80% uh, that some facilities are managed, managed to um, get to. Well, that's still one out of five patients who have an experience without hand hygiene um, routinely. And environmental cleaning, we need environmental cleaning. We should always be working on that as well. It's been shown to be significant. But hand hygiene compliance is still around 50%, which is why they've introduced um, UV robots and other technologies to help with that. These are all adjuncts that all work together. Each one works to benefit. The same thing with targeted um, with bundles. Uh, mm -hmm. The bundles actually um, succeed as well. But all these together, and we've seen that uh, there's still opportunities for improvement because not any one strategy does it all. So this um, nasal decolonization is another strategy to add on to our existing uh, basic practices of infection prevention we've been doing for 50 years. So- One other uh, thing, oh, I'm sorry, Karen. Uh, just wanted to add one more thing. I uh, wanted to mention the Dr. Jernigan, who is a leader in the field of infectious disease and is an expert on drug-resistant organisms, including MRSA. And he presented at a CDC webinar uh, that was really talking, it was a, a forum for industry and healthcare to look at what we can do to help mitigate the risk of antibiotic resistant organisms, which we know we're struggling with. And Dr. Jernigan challenged healthcare organizations and industry to say these basic practices, hand hygiene, isolation practices, et cetera, wasn't doing it. And his question to everyone was, Will nasal decolonization help us? And he gave an estimation. He made a theoretical model that basically said, if we decolonize a colonized patient, we could prevent an estimated nine infections and prevent three deaths. Something for us to think about specific to adding this as an object to these other basic practices where compliance is an opportunity. Thank you both. It's uh, a great answer. Let me uh, ask another question here from Kali. Is nasal decolonization a treatment that is paid for by the patient's insurance through their coverage? So that's, a, that's actually a good question. And uh, I'm not sure of the answer. Um, I think that the best thing to do would be to ask uh, those individuals within your hospital that looks at how that kind of care would be reimbursed. Um, I really am not aware of how that would be addressed, quite honestly. Karen, do you have any idea? I don't believe it would be a, a straightforward reimbursement. I don't think so. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the care is bundled by procedure and, and, and uh, admission um, diagnosis. So it would just be um, something like, you know, using gloves or or cleaning the room or, you know, PPE use and all those things. They not individually, um, uh, uh, individually charged. Yeah, that makes sense. Great, moving on to the next one. Uh, Karen, I, and I think this one's for you. Uh, you had a slide with uh, sharing the product evolution. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could expand a little bit more about that, especially um, with a focus on mupirocin. Yeah. Um, so as you heard, I've been in infection, Connie and I both have been infection preventionists for 40 years, nurses for, um, you know, 45 years more. And what we've seen a lot of things. And so with what we've seen in terms of decolonization in the 80s, when they were having a lot, a lot of staph outbreaks, this is when MRSA was really first emerging and then going rapidly the surgeons who knew that, that the nose colonization associated with wound infections, that had been known since the 30s. 
And so they were anxious to do something about it. And a lot of different products, mostly all antibiotics were tried to decolonize the nose, recognizing that the nose to the wound and nose to the device was, was, what, was what was causing these HAIs. So they landed on Mepiracin as being the most effective uh, and it is, it does work to, to some degree, as we saw. It takes, however, five days before it's fully effective at 93%. So five days is a very long time. At three days, it's about 60% effective. It does work, but there is that time to, in order for the nose to decolonize through the exposure to antibiotics. Uh, they are given twice a day, as we know, Bactroban, but they're not very pleasant to use if anybody's tried to put um, Bactroban or Neosporin up their nose for any reason, uh, patients don't like it, it drips. So if we ask them to do it at home, there's poor compliance before they come in for these big uh, surgeries. Uh, compliance has been record reported to be about 50% uh, overall. And so that's not going to uh, help your outcomes uh, with that use when you can't get good compliance because people don't like the product. So uh, for, for, for all those reasons, uh, people continue to look for a better, um, you know, a better opportunity for decolonization, a better, a better technology. And povidone iodine was the first one that came around. And povidone iodine does work immediately. Uh, it doesn't have that five-day lag as all antiseptics do, but it is also unpleasant and can't be used more than a couple of days. So it's really uh, just a pre-op. And as we've been talking about, we don't want to just use it as a pre-op. We want to protect all patients for their entire stay. So that's how, um, with continued, uh, you know, continued research, the um, hand hygiene alcohol products that we use, uh, someone recognized that that could be an opportunity for a new technology to decolonize the nose, and indeed, um, that is what they, that is what we have found. So. Uh, Connie, you can jump in there if you got... Um... No, I think you did a, a really good job. I do want to mention that uh, just last month, I think it was in Itchy, uh, there was a study done at Vanderbilt on was povidone iodine an acceptable replacement for mupiracin. And what they found, uh, and this was just published, uh, um, it, what was it, Karen, in June or July? Uh, and it said that it was not an, an acceptable alternative to mipiracin because the patients uh, did not, uh, they weren't enchanted with the product, they didn't like the product, and neither than the healthcare provider. So yeah. compliance and getting it used consistently on patients was going to be a challenge. I think, yeah, and, you know, something else, uh, yeah, something else that's evolving is the resistance. And I didn't really mention whenever you're using an antibiotic, you know, oh, you have to be careful one. about resistance and the emergence of resistance. So the more we use uh, an antibiotic like mupiracin, particularly on patients who aren't even colonized, let's say we're decolonizing everyone with mupiracin in the ICUs and high risk in surgeries as currently recommended, it's bound to have resistance problems. And that has been reported now by um, several facilities that are actually monitoring it. For one thing, a lot of facilities aren't, you know, don't have the technology or aren't monitoring for mucirosin resistance um, routinely. They might do a sample every now and then, but they it's going to be an opportunity to be missed that they're having resistance in any one or many patients. And the more mucirosin that's used, for example, our repeat patients, uh, there's their chances of resistance goes up dramatically according to the reported literature. So resistance rates of thirty to seventy five percent with mupiracin um, are now being reported in the U.S. and in other countries where other countries where they're not uh, limiting that use of antibiotic and we always see resistance develop in other countries um, because of that use early and then eventually it gets to the U.S. So this is an emerging problem with the widespread use of mupiracin. Yeah. And what I would challenge all of you to do is if you are using mupiracin within your healthcare organization, ask the question, do you know what your mepiracin susceptibility or resistance level is? Uh, if you're using mepiracin, you should know that. And it's something that I think should be discussed if it's something that is not being taken care of in your organization. Appreciate that. Let me direct the next question to you, Connie. Can you give specific examples of metrics you're tracking and presenting to leadership? Oh, absolutely. So with this kind of metric, you would uh, look at uh, outcomes where you are concerned about 
um, your infection rates uh, for Monument Hill, oops, for one of the hospitals, sorry, for one of the hospitals that uh, Karen shared, they used uh, central line associated bloodstream infections and ventilator associated pneumonia, saw tremendous reductions in both. And they also monitor the process. The key to their success was that the, the, they sustained it. And after they got the implementation of use of alcohol decolonizing agent to greater than 90% in their facility, they discontinued screen and isolate for MRSA, which made everybody happy. And even so, the reduction in their outcomes occurred. So key is measuring the process that's changed and then also outcomes that it should impact. And it could be CLABSI, ventilator associated pneumonia or events, um, MRSA bacteremia, surgical site infections where your infection risk is high. And in some of the studies that have been done uh, with alcohol nasal decolonization, they looked at all cause surgeries and saw reductions in all cause SSIs. Uh, so uh, that's another way that you might be able to look at it. Those were pre our presented. Uh, what you saw that Karen presented was what was presented to leadership in those organizations. Uh, the first big hospital, let me tell you what they did that was key. They took it to the medical exec committee. And when they took it to the medical exec committee, they respected IP and the ID doc so much. They said, okay, we're giving it six months. Come back and show me the results of the outcome and the process in six months. And we'll go from there. They came back at six months. They had zero infections um, for CLABSIs and uh, their PVAPs had gone down. And so the medical exec committee said, wow, this is amazing. I think we'll continue with this. Today, I talked to them last week. They've only had one CLABSI in about a year and a half. That's it. Thank you, Connie. Um, Karen, I know you touched on guidelines, so maybe this is a good question for you here. Um, can you talk about your perspective on on how new product, new products, new protocols um, are influenced by guidelines? Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, Kevin. That is a good. You know, we wait on guideline updates, and you know, guidelines are a bible. You know, we try to do all the all the category one recommendations, um, 1A recommendations that are based on often randomized controlled trials. <clears throat> and these randomized controlled trials are very expensive, very labor intensive to do. So uh, in the meantime, we're relying on gray data. And um, the, what that does is it lags in time between these studies being done, studies being published, and ultimately a review of these studies uh, getting into guidelines. So I have seen uh, myself that, you know, guidelines only get updated usually about every 10 years by the CDC uh, on average. And sometimes it takes seven or eight or nine years for guidelines to even get um, through the review process, which can prolong that uh, experience. So um, so what we need to do is just keep up with the, with the literature. And we've always had to do that, you know, whether it's... Um, uh, and with hand hygiene, new, new technologies and products or, or, or environmental cleaning, because the, there's a revolution in, in those kind of products. Um, we need to look and, and respect the guidelines, uh, but also to keep up with the literature. And that's hard to do. And that's why, um, you know, you have to be uh, very careful about your um, review of industry related data and look for, for uh, meaningful data coming from uh, really um, facilities like the ones that we talked about today that were not industry supported or funded, but that just had such great outcomes that they wanted to share them and report them. So um, this has always been true and it's a challenge for IPs uh, for sure to keep up with those guidelines. Fortunately, the AORN guidelines that were uh, updated in 2021 did look and consider the 16 reported studies at the time that showed significant uh, improvements in outcomes when surgery. And so they actually updated their guidelines based on that information. But, you know, not, um, and there's also that uh, to deal with as well as when there's differences in guidelines information. Appreciate that, uh, Karen. This is perhaps uh, 
It related a question from Penny. What control studies have been done? Why is the level of not gray sources not there? So right now, these these facilities are these are you know early adopter, uh, late adopter, kind of moving towards that. Um, a randomized controlled study is very very expensive. Pretty much the only way to get those done now is through an Epi Center grant and um, and or an ARC grant or something like that that's willing to look at it where you can you know um, put uh, multiple hospitals into a study protocol. But I actually think there's a lot of value in looking at these real world experiences like these hospitals have where they they change to a, a new protocol like nasal decolonization and see these uh, significant outcome results. So one of the things that we can do when that happens, when you can't get a big epicenter study, and there's not very many of those actually on any single topic of things that we actually implement and do as a standard of care, there's only a handful of those kind of big studies out there that we rely on. What we do now, which is really pretty cool, and I was one, I did one of the first meta-analyses uh, ever published on the use of uh, dressing materials. And um, currently, as you heard, be mentioned, I'm working on a meta-analysis of all these different small studies together on surgical outcomes using this uh, nasal decolonization product. And, you know, it, the literature suggests that meta-analysis actually have more weight, uh, carry more uh, value in terms of they're all, you know, independently reported results rather than one clinical trial um, or as good as that was run. So um, a meta-analysis is 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 very powerful and and that's what we have to rely on a lot of times for looking to what should be the new standards of care when we don't have the benefit of having a large randomized very expensive controlled trial here that was very well said and the other thing i want you to look at when you get the toolkit information that kevin will send is look at the years of publication on those uh, studies that have been done they're very recent it is not easy if you've ever uh, submitted for publication to prepare a publication and get it through the review process. So you can start and it usually takes a year and a half, two years, quite honestly. So we have to remember that. Uh, as a very senior seasoned IP, Karen and I both depend not only on the guidelines, but on those things that are happening innovatively in our field. And so what I would do at a national conference is spend time in the abstract room. And I would look at posters and abstracts and go to the oral presentations to look at what the innovative prevention strategies are that are coming and evolving. And that's where I found universal nasal decolonization. Appreciate that. Um, this one's for you, Connie, as, as a change management expert. Yeah. Can, can you explain how the facilities you mentioned successfully implement their nasal decolonization programs? Well, it's really important to recognize that it's not as simple as having a good process and protocol uh, in place. Uh, you have to take time. I call it go slow to go fast. Uh, taking time to get co-champions and influences those people in leadership to come on board with you to number one, get it approved. And to do that, you've got to show value and the effectiveness of the program to those leaders because without leadership support and it being aligned with organizational priorities, it's not going to happen. So that's step number one, getting it approved. And you can do that alone. It takes a village. Make sure that you talk to people ahead of time before meetings to say, this is what we're fixing to do. Do you have any questions? We want to present this next week at a meeting. So pre-planning is vital and making sure you identify those individuals that you need to influence to bring to your side. That takes time. The key part of the equation that we ignore, which is the why most change initiatives fail, over 60% of them do, is because we've got to deal with the people side of change. People have to be held accountable. They have to have communication and focus via monitoring so that they can change behavior and understand from leadership and their managers that this is just one of those things that's just not going to pass in the wind after about six months to a year. It's here to stay because it's a standard of practice. Lastly, 
we've got to communicate back the value. When we see impact on HAIs and we see it go down, we got to not only show the reduced outcome, I would take it as far as showing them the cost avoided, the length of stay uh, avoided, et cetera, et cetera, so that they understand that what you've done has made a difference. Both of these hospitals that Karen talked about did similar things. Appreciate that perspective, Karen. Uh, Connie. Karen, uh, you mentioned universal approaches are better than targeted ones. Could you elaborate on why that might be the case? Uh, sure. Um, well, you know, when you do a targeted approach, that's great for that individual patient um, that, you know, you want to protect, but it does, doesn't do anything. It's really a containment strategy. Um, so you're containing it to that patient, but then there's all these other patients you don't know about who are, you know, as the 30% of admissions coming in are colonized. And if there's no management of those staff, staff or risk colonized patients, they're able to share with their roommate or, you know, contaminate, uh, you know, the areas around them for the next patient coming in. As I mentioned, there's about a 40% increased risk of the next patient coming into a room of a patient that had staph aureus versus if you decolonize that patient on admission and not allowed all that colonization pressure in the room and the procedure areas and everywhere else the patient goes on the equipment that goes between patients and the staff that go between patients. So uh, a targeted approach, you know, will help that individual patient, but all patients are worthy of being protected. And so uh, uh, an all patient strategy, uh, standard of care, a horizontal approach, as Connie mentioned, is, is what we know through everything that we do in healthcare is the best approach when it can be done. And it's only recently that we've had the technology uh, to actually do that with uh, nasal decolonization. I appreciate that, uh, Karen. And just as a reminder to, uh, to the audience, if you have any more questions, feel free to add them to the chat box. You'll also find a survey uh, questionnaire that you can click on a, a link and it's just real short and that feedback will be incredibly valuable uh, for the presenters. And I think this is gonna give us just a final question here. <laughs> All right, so let's see, last one. Um, this relates to the data that was presented on the facilities and uh, on your parent, feel free to grab that. It, uh, the question was, how is this data uh, generated? Which I, I, I assume that that might be so, more. But it was yeah, that's a, the hospital uh, generates the data. They conduct surveillance like all IP programs do, and they develop uh, their um, HAI rates and produce those and monitor and trend them. Now, Karen also presented value data, the cost data, and I'm going to turn it over to her about how that was uh, conducted. Right. So the value data, we've got good information on, you know, what the um, length of stay, average length of stay is in, uh, patients across the U.S., and we can actually fine-tune uh, that if a hospital wanted to fine tune to, to their own, you know, rate of occupancy and, and uh, turnover and uh, what their costs are for those procedures. So it was generated from real data that um, came from that hospital, the two hospitals presented, they, they calculated that based on their length of stay, based on their turnover, based on their costs. Um, and, and it can be done either from national, you know, printed nationally uh, rates or from the individual hospital. And I just want to add where you start with all that. And where you start with all of this is with, with risk assessment. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Like I, what's my first step? My first step of value and my first step of showing why we need to do this would be based on um, your individual hospital's number of um, staff cases that were admitted in the previous year. And if that's not possible, then a national average could be used at 30%. Uh, same thing with MRSA and then, and then the associated costs. So a risk assessment can be done. There's um, you know, an algorithm for that and vendors can help with that, um, doing that if that's uh, something that you would need assistance with. I would Excellent. say that that risk assessment is very important to just comment on because it ensures that it's an area of opportunity and that it's aligned with organizational priorities, which is extremely, extremely important uh, to move forward. You got to get the leadership buy-in. 
Excellent. Well, I know we're at the top of the hour, so I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. I'd like to thank the LeapFrog Group for hosting this webinar, and Karen and Connie, um, thank you again for, for uh, putting on this presentation, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.